welcome to Argumentative Indians. I'm pleased to continue my conversation with Professor Patan Burshad on the intriguing subject of Tantra. In our last conversation, we talked about India's age of Tantra. We looked at how Tantra gained popularity and royal patronage, rose to prominence and went on to co-opt Vedic Brahmanism. In this session, we will discuss the powerful forces that led to the eventual decline of Tantra in India. We will see how this important system of Indian philosophy and spirituality become conflated with occult and black magic. So join me. Now that we know, have a sense of what Tantra was historically, particularly in the medieval age, then how do we get to this? How do we get to Tantra as understood as um, primarily just black magic, the occult, a kind of dangerous, sinister thing? Um, and how does this contrast with that and kind of good, wholesome, devotional religion develop? Well, the most obvious answer is one that follows the logic of what you would call post-colonial studies. And that would be that this is the result of the influence of the British and of Protestant Christian Orientalist scholars and colonists. So many of you will know that the field of post-colonial studies has sought to demonstrate that many, if not most, of the forms of Indian modernity today are deeply influenced by even a direct result of the British colonial presence. So just for example, according to post-colonial scholars, Indian understandings of science and of what constitutes proper religion were fundamentally molded by and can be traced back to British colonial attitudes, British categories, British modes of thought. So one of the changes that it's generally thought that the British brought about was the shaping of Indian conceptions of religion into a shape conforming to European enlightenment dispositions. So Europeans had, had uh, you know, as a result of their own history, had these categories of this is proper religion and this over here is not. That's magic. That's not proper religion. And this, uh, this argument would be that basically these ideas rub off during the British colonial period on Indians. And Orientalist characterizations of bhakti and tantra would seem to offer evidence of just this. When you look at late 19th, early 20th century Western scholars, they drew on native Christian, especially Protestant conceptions of religion as being something that's monotheistic, something that's personal, something that's faith oriented to identify bhakti first with Krishna worship, but later with the larger category of Vaishnavism. And in this process, they characterized bhakti religion as a kind of reformed Hinduism, an Indian instance of Christian-like monotheistic devotion to a personal god. On the other hand, however, tantric forms of Hindu tradition with their focus on power, their sometimes bloody and erotic imagery and rites served as the magical foil to bhakti religion and were quickly singled out as India's darkest, most irrational element, the extreme Orient, the most exotic aspect of the exotic Orient itself. In particular, we see this in the work of Monier Monier Williams, a 19th century British scholar of India. He wrote that bhakti, which he identified with Vaishnavism, is, quote, the only Hindu system worthy of being called a religion. And he stated furthermore that bhakti alone among Hindu religious forms possesses the essential elements of a genuine religion. For there can be no true religion without personal devotion to a personal god. When it came to Tantra, however, Monier Williams had a very different opinion. It was he who actually used the term Tantrism for the first time as a singular monolithic class. And he remarked disparagingly that Tantrism is Hinduism arrived at its last and worst stage of medieval development. He asserted that the tantras are generally mere manuals of mysticism, magic, and superstition of the worst and most silly kind. So here in Monier Williams' conception, which I think is a very typical one of the time, 
Bhakti, with its more familiar, rational, Christian-like devotional approach, gets defined as religion in opposition to Tantra, with its unfamiliar, unapproved perspectives and practices, which gets labeled as magic and superstition. So as this story typically goes, these Western colonial perceptions then got appropriated by Indian reformers of Hinduism, from Ramohan Roy to Bharatindu Harishchandra to Swami Vivekananda, who would raise up Bhakti and Vedantic philosophy while criticizing Tantra as a corrupt tradition of magic and superstition that needed to be cleansed from Hinduism. So when we consider these sorts of historical figures and their views alongside current present day conceptions of Bhakti and Tantra, it might seem we have evidence for a rather open and shut case of Western colonial perspectives making their way into the outlooks of the Indian people. I'd like to suggest that this is in fact not the case, or at least that the situation is not at all so simple. My take, the whole take of my whole book is that post-colonial studies and that approach has, we've learned a lot from it, and there's no doubt that colonialism had a huge impact on Indian culture and on the makeup even of Indian society today. This is undeniable, and post-colonial studies has shown us, you know, the details of that. However, I think the kind of pendulum of post-colonial interpretations has swung a little bit too far, um, to the point that now many scholars seek the answers for modern Indian perspectives only in the colonial period and fail to look back further and see continuities. And so part of my work is to do just that. So my research suggests, um, can I put my screen back up there? Oh, I think I lost the screen sharing ability. You can do it, you can do it. go ahead. Okay. This is my answer that, in fact, the origins of modern day Indian understandings of bhakti and tantra actually lie in India's early modern period, roughly 1500 to 1700, before the British had any significant presence in India. So it is the case that the British expanded upon and intensified a certain view of bhakti and tantra, but their own understanding of these traditions was in many ways drawn from pre-existing, already circulating indigenous Indian perspectives. Specifically, my argument is that the trend toward conceiving bhakti and tantra as two distinct, even opposed genres of religiosity with characteristics that in many ways mirror a sort of religion versus magic distinction, that that really first emerges in North India's bhakti movement in the early modern period. So let me kind of um, unpack that argument. That'll be the last part of today's lecture. So historically, the end of the tantric age um, really begins, I mean, I'm going to try to, I'm going to not read through all of these points. I'll let you do that on your own. I'm just going to try to, um, to summarize them in my own words as you read through them. But in short, the Tantric Age ends with the Delhi Sultanate. That's overly simplistic, but for our purposes, we can, we can frame it like that. Um, Delhi Sultanate period, 1206 to 1526. And essentially, one of my arguments is that while the British colonial period is, is important to talk about and change so much, um, sometimes in emphasizing that, we forget about how much India changed with the influx of Persianate Turks into India um, and Islam and Sufism, and really broader than either Islam or Sufism, Persian culture um, comes into India in a major way and um, with the Delhi Sultanate. And essentially, um, you know, I think it, there's a problematic kind of narrative of, of Indian history in which this is a Muslim invasion um, to identify the people who came in as first and foremost as Muslims is really to miss the larger picture 
they were that was their religious identity but that wasn't how indians at the time perceived them first and foremost or even how they understood themselves first and foremost that's a that's a sort of projection of modern day um kind of categories that are focused on religious identity onto the past in fact these were ethnically turkish people for the most part afghans as well who culturally and this is culturally and linguistically and this is what's most important were persian and there was a very rich persian culture that islam was a part of and this was a particular version of islam right because islam of course originates in an arabic context an arabic language but as it moves eastward into the persianate region of including modern day iran but also afghanistan and central asia then Islam is Persianized and changes. And so it's a particularly Persian form of Islam and Sufism that comes into India as part of a larger Persian culture. But the key point is that as these Persian Turks achieve military and political dominance over most of North and Central India, there are some temples destroyed and desecrated. And that's another topic, the, the, the reason for the destructions um, in general was not religious antagonism. It was a very political motivation because temples were sites of royal power. This was something Hindu rulers have been doing to each other for centuries. If a Hindu you know, upstart chieftain wants to take over a kingdom, the first thing he's going to do is destroy that ruler's royal temple because it's the symbol of his political power. So this was happening in India that kings were destroying each other's temples and the Persian Turks just followed that practice because that was how you delegitimated, delegitimated the ruler. So there were temples destroyed and desecrated, but once the initial conquest was over, there's no evidence that those destructions continued. In fact, both under Sultanate and Mughal rule, Hindu temples were patronized by these uh, in, in, the, in this era. But the point is that Persian culture, the real conflict isn't Hindu versus Muslim. That's not how it was understood at the time. It's Persian culture versus Brahminical Sanskritic culture. That's the real conflict. Because for millennia in India, to express yourself in you know, literature, to express yourself in the arts, in scholarship, the language of power and sophistication was Sanskrit. That's unquestioned. And who, was the, who were the arbiters of Sanskrit? The Brahmins. And Brahmins were just assumed in Indian culture to be, you have to have your rule sanctified by Brahmins. Brahmins are these just crucial kind of class. The Persians who came in, they just didn't share those assumptions. Sanskrit, that's not special to us. We don't feel like, you know, a, a, a scholar, you know, a work of scholarship or um, philosophy or literature needs to be in Sanskrit for it to be good. And we also don't feel like we need to be consecrated by Brahmins to be like valid rulers. So that was the real conflict. And what you have is as Persianate culture expands militarily, politically, but also just culturally, um, there's no longer the same support. The no, there's no longer the royal patronage for tantric institutions that was there before. And so institutional tantra gradually kind of declines. Um, and you see that in, in the written comments here. So um, here's just a quick slide on Delhi Sultanate, which really is a, a term, of course, referring to five different Sultanate dynasties. Um, and this is the period um, when, you know, Islam and particularly a Sufi form of Islam becomes a major influence. And it really, and what you might call an Indo-Persian culture forms that um, you know is impossible to to parse out today. Like we know that Hindi and Urdu, for example, at the spoken common level are basically the same language. Like that's just one kind of um, indication of how Indo-Persian culture like merged together in ways that we can't like now um, like piece apart. You know, pull it apart. That's it's impossible. Um, so the Delhi Sultanate, um, critical time and. In the Delhi Sultanate, we have, it's not so much that Tantra completely dies, it's just that institutional, public, patronized Tantra goes into decline. So Tantric ritual forms and techniques persist, but often in non-Tantric contexts. So many of the rituals developed in Tantra 
still keep getting used, but they're not in the same context. They're in the context of bhakti or they're in the context of Vedanta understandings. Um, at the same time, while sort of these major traditions like Shaiva Siddhanta and those tantric monastic orders go into decline, there are sort of less patronage dependent lineage of tantric ascetics that continue to persist and even um, become more popular. The, the primary example being the not yogis. So I would argue that the not yogis are in fact the primary public representatives of Tantra after the Delhi Sultanate. And these, uh, of course, they trace their roots back to Goraknat and Matsindranat. Um, they have roots in the Siddha tradition and in Kaula Shaivism. Um, but the knots are really a very diverse group. They're not, um, they don't, they didn't share any particular system of practice or even uh, ideas. They had, there were certain kind of things that linked them. They had distinctive insignia. They often wore a large hooped earrings and a singi, a horn around their neck. So there was a, a sort of I, a visual identifier. Um, and they basically had what I call them the main representatives of Tantra as they, their their whole process was becoming divine right and accessing divine power and they didn't do that so much through like the tantric rituals of the tantric age so much as through yogic practices particularly um forms of of laya yoga that are connected to kundalini yoga and also forms of hatha yoga were being used by um the not yogis to divinize themselves to access um this sacred power that is that's a very tantric kind of perspective and that I argue um, was in key tension with both the Sufi perspective and the Bhakti perspective. So this is where um, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can, but this is really what my book um, talks about in much more depth. Like actually there's only one chapter in my book about the tantric age. Most of my book is about the early modern period, the rise of the Bhakti movement and how it distinguishes itself from um, tantrikas and yogis um, in uh, especially the Mughal period. So one thing that's key about the Delhi Sultanate is the spread of Sufism. Who are Sufis? You see, again, they emphasize a direct mystical relationship with, um, with God. Um, the model Sufi is in many ways has parallels with both with the Hindu bhakta, right? And, and Hindu ascetics and that they're both seeking to annihilate the ego self to get into a transformative intimate relationship with the divine. And they're doing that through asceticism, meditation and passionate devotion. These are things that are, these traits really set them up in, in parallel with Hindu bhaktas who um, were doing much the same if directed toward different deities, of course. So the Sufi tradition, very, you know, I won't go into depth on this, but it expands across India during the, the centuries of Sultanate rule and becomes a major cultural force. The predominant form of Islam that influences Indian culture is a Sufi form. Um, there was, of course, a more, um, uh, which a form that's connected to the ulama that was much more conservative, especially in the urban centers. Um, but their influence on the broader culture was, wasn't much at all compared to Sufisms. Um, so here you see that um, Sufis were actually interacting with the not yogis and other tantric yogis quite a lot. And they, there's lots of writing showing this. They were borrowing from each other. Sufis were taking tantric yogic techniques and melding them with their own Sufi practice. But my take is that mo more important than their similarities is their differences. And you can see that on this chart here. You see what the religious goals and attitudes of the not yogis. So tantric yogis were in contrast to that of Sufis. And the reason I put this up here is because one of my arguments is that North India's bhakti movement is what I call Sufi inflected. It's influenced in very subtle ways that aren't, aren't often direct by Sufi perspectives. So it's not so much that everything in bhakti doesn't have a distinctly Hindu sort of precedent. It does, but it's why those particular elements of Hindu tradition kind of become important when they do 
I argue, is because they're resonating with Sufi perspectives that are becoming more and more prominent in the Indian subcontinent that have to do with the goal of divine love and experiencing that humility before God and passionate love and longing for God, conceiving God more as love than as a moral sacred power. These are pretty big distinctions. And on, on these distinctions, Sufis are far more like bhaktas and both are quite distinct from tantric yogis. So this is my point in that um, line that just came up. So this brings us to the bhakti movement of North India that occurs during the Mughal period. Again, just briefly, here's um, a map of the expansion of Mughal empire over multiple centuries, 1526 to um, really, I'm just going to the through the end of the, the rule of Aurangzeb here is the Mughal Empire I'm concerned with. But interestingly, when North India's Bhakti ha movement happens is under Mughal rule. It's patronized by Mughals. And, um, you know, a key part of um, the Mughal sort of administrative apparatus was Rajputs, Hindu Rajputs, um, particularly, as I talk about in my book, Kachwahas from um, Rajasthan. Um, so Man Singh is one that most, most of you have heard of, really key Kachwaha, who was very high up in the Mughal administration and working with Akbar. And, but there are others, Kachwahas and other Rajputs as well, who were very important and influential within the Mughal empire and were working with the imperial apparatus as they were um, patronizing and really providing the sort of financial and physical support necessary for India's Bhakti movement and North India's Bhakti movement, I should specify, to kind of explode like it did. So uh, here we go. Here are just some key features of that Bhakti movement. I won't, I'll let you just skim through these. Um, the one that I want to emphasize, all these first three are ones that other scholars have talked about. The one feature that um, my work is somewhat unique in emphasizing is this last one, that a key feature of Mughal's Bhakti movement was the expression of a devotional sensibility that was distinct from and often positioned in opposition to explicitly certain tantric and yogic paradigms of religion. And, you know, I provide lots of evidence for this through the book, but since we don't have a lot of time, I just want to show you two examples. And those are, you can see them in the work of um, the poetry of both Kabir and Tulsidas. So I want to briefly talk about them. Um, I'm going to skip this, um, but this is just a slide, again, emphasizing that Sufis and Bhaktas, of course, had important differences, but they also had a lot in common. There was a spectrum of devotional approaches to Tantra and yoga. I don't mean to say what I'm about to talk to is the only one, but I'm gonna focus on this far end of the spectrum that I have highlighted in yellow, just for purposes of time. And you do see Bhakti compositions from North India's Bhakti movement that criticize, marginalize, and satirize Tantric yogis and Tantra more broadly in Bhakti manuscript sources from throughout the late 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries and found in locations stretching across North and Central India, all the way from Maharashtra in the South to Bengal and Assam in the East and to Punjab in, in Gujarat in the West. So basically what I wanna argue is if you look at the different Bhakti authors during in North India's Bhakti movement, um, from authors from many different regions, Punjab, Bengal, Malwa, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, the Gangetic Plain, that even despite all their differences in how they're expressing bhakti, they all seem to be united by a common critique of the religion of tantric yogis. And often they were caricaturing tantric yogis, but it still shows this some sort of unity that's helping to define a new bhakti identity. And again, the not yogis are the primary sort of thing that uh, community that's being caricatured. So William Pinch has put it like this. The Bhaktas conflict with Tantrikas like the Nat Yogis was not simply an argument about style. It reflected a profound disagreement about the very nature of God and whether men could legitimately aspire to be gods. 
And as such, it reflected a deep disagreement about the meaning of religion itself. So again, you guys know who Kabir is. I won't belabor the point here, but he does have a number of, of songs and verses that explicitly critique um, the not yogis and tantric yogis more generally. Um, here in a mocking tone, he critiques the famous founder of the Nats, Goraknat. Gorak couldn't keep his breath, though he knew some yogic tricks. Power, profit, control, yes, but he couldn't go beyond. Here, Kabir stresses the inability of the Nat yogi's tantric methods to achieve anything other than worldly goals. Again and again in his poetry, Kabir drives home the point that tantric yogi's practices get them absolutely nowhere, for without devotion to God, one remains spiritually empty-handed. He says, brother, even dressed up with your staff, earrings, patchwork cloak, and armrest, you have gone astray. Madman, give up yogic posture, asana, and breath control. Madman, give up trickery and always worship Hari. In another poem, he states, go naked if you want, put on animal skins. What does it matter till you see the inward Ram? If the union yogis seek came from roaming around in the buff, every deer in the forest would be saved. And if shaving your head spelled spiritual success, heaven would be filled with sheep. And brother, if holding back your seed earned you a place in paradise, eunuchs would be the first to arrive. Kabir says, listen, brother, without the name of Ram, who has ever won the spirit's prize? Now I want to turn again, just with, with speed in mind here, I want to finish up so we have a chance to talk about all this. I turned to Tulsidas, and I've deliberately, very deliberately chosen Kabir and Tulsidas. In my book, I go through a bunch of bhakti poets who have verses um, against tantric yogis, but I choose Kabir and Tulsidas because it would seem they couldn't be more different, right? One is a Brahmin, one is a Shudra, um, one is... Um, you know, conservative, one is socially liberal. These are very different figures, yet they were united in their critique of tantric yogis, which I think is interesting. So Tulsidas writes, without detachment, without mantric recitation, without sacrifices, yoga and fast, without asceticism, without sacrificing the body, Tulsi says, all contentment is quickly and easily obtained if you simply love the salvation granting feet of God. So not only are these other tantric and yogic modes of religious, religious practice needless, he actually says they're ineffective. In the Vinay Patrika, Tulsi states, people follow the prescriptions of the agamas, the tantras, reciting mantras, doing sacrifices, but they do not obtain their goal. Even in dreams, contentment does not come from the practice of yoga in cities. Only sickness and sorrow remain. Tulsi says, without trust and love in God, one wanders aimlessly, is defeated, and dies. Indeed, it's Tulsi Das who has what I think is the most striking of the bhakti verses that show a conflict between bhaktas and not yogis at this time. In his Kavatavali, he refers to the founder of the Nat Yogis, saying, Gorak Jagayo Jog, Bhakti Bagayo Log. Gorak awakened yoga and drove Bhakti away from the people. Here, Tulsi boldly proclaims that not only are tantric yogic teachings of the Nats opposed to those of Bhakti, but they've actually caused Bhakti to weaken among the people. So, again, this is a very kind of quick, abbreviated way of showing you that. Bhaktas across the spectrum in Mughal India were writing against often a caricatured tantric yogi, especially the not yogi, as a way to define a new vision of bhakti and devotion as a sort of proper religion in contrast to magical tantra um, that is very sort of selfish and arrogant in, in comparison to the humble religion of um, of bhakti. And I think that here you find this pre-colonial kind of evidence for a bhakti tantra distinction that isn't exactly what we have today, but you see how it informs it in hugely important ways. So the last thing I want to say is, is I'm going to skip all this. Tantra today, three 
ways to think about Tantra today. The first one is simply that Tantra it infuses Hinduism today, but it's just, it's, it's, it's sort of hidden in plain sight. Things that are Tantric are everywhere. They're just not called Tantric because the word Tantric has come to mean black magic. So if you look at in terms of just like what ritual forms are being used in just like everyday Hinduism, they are found in the Agamas, in the Samhitas, in the Tantras. They originate during the Tantric period. So as Andre Padu states, nowadays one often finds Tantric elements, notions, or practices in a non-Tantric context. So this is the first thing to realize that when you think about Tantra today is that it's everywhere. We just don't call it Tantric because of the work connotations that word has come to have. Number two, this is the one that's closest connected to those images we've seen, right? Many textual scholars have said, you know, Tantra is about dangerous power, impurity, black magic. And this is the kind of Tantra that you're well aware of. You see it in movies, right? And there's TV serials that you know, there's been a real interest in like the Agoris, for instance, who again are this kind of marginal group, yet the amount of attention because it's so sensationalist, right? Let's talk about the Agoris, you know, scary tantricas, but there really haven't been that influential of a tradition. Um, but this stuff is out there. And there's also a perception in media reports out there related to this, that it's sort of like the unenlightened, uneducated um, rural Indians are like subject to the superstitions of tantricas. And there's even been for example, in um, Maharashtra, you're probably aware, in 2013, um, Maharashtra became the first Indian state to pass a law, the Maharashtra Prevention and Eradication of Human Sacrifice and Other Inhuman Evil and Agori Practices and Black Magic Act. Wow, that's a very lengthy act. Um, making it explicitly illegal to practice human sacrifice or to deceive, defraud, or terrorize the public by propagating so-called miracles or invoking ghosts or mantras. So there's this whole like rationalist movement and it's seen that like the people subject to Tantra are these like ignorant rural people who are superstitious. And so that's a one piece, but what that sort of take on Tantra doesn't doesn't do justice to is that there's another form of Tantra, which is number three, this is the final one, that is quite pervasive in popular culture in India today. Um, Philip Lukendorf has talked about how in this kind of neoliberal consumer capitalist India that we've seen since the 90s, right, Tantra has become more interesting to people. They want the kind of quick fix that Tantra can com combine, but without the bad associations of Tantra. So you have kind of quick fix Tantra, but often in a Vaishnava context, or Madhukana has done some great work on what she calls Bazari Tantra, popular forms of orally transmitted Tantric practice that you see throughout the marketplace, molded to the ethos of consumer capitalism, in which you have Tantric ritual and yogic prescriptions, all about acquiring power to solve life's problems, to attain one's neoliberal consumer capitalist desires. She says, Tantra, for better or worse, has found a new space in the public arena and is now regularly engaged with by Indian film stars, high-powered business people, civil servants, and politicians. So again, I think these are kind of three ways to think about Tantra or three ways Tantra is thought about in India today that I just want to kind of leave you with. And with that, I will stop lecturing and we can open this up. Thank you, Professor Bhushat. I think this might be the most comprehensive and definitive lecture on Tantra out there in the public sphere so far. So thanks a lot for that. That was, that was amazing. I might have to watch the video a few more times to assimilate everything. But, he, but some things that just struck out to me um, is very interesting was you started off with talking about the expansion of agrarian uh, civilization or peoples and then uh, incorporating the various tribal groups the forest people as we call them in India into their fold and at that time you talk about the main Brahmanical orthodoxy co-opting a lot of tribal gods and practices into its fold but further down the conversation as Tantra becomes bigger and bigger you say that it was Tantra's smart move or whatever 
deliberately or inadvertently to co-opt Brahmanical orthodoxy into its fold, where they say that Vedas are part of Tantra, but Tantras transcend the Vedas. So it's actually interesting. It's not, it's kind of like it becomes one of those things who co-opted whom ultimately. And um, because it, at some point, it seems to make a lot of sense that perhaps these were pre-Brahmanical customs in India, or, or at least in certain pop, among certain groups of India that continue and become, because go, the way we see these fierce goddesses in Tantra, they don't seem to fit into the whole Vedic setup. Um, so the, it seems that they do come from a different religious thought lineage and they sort of became part of it. But, um, but at the same time, I wonder, like, there is seems, to, at least when we talk about the practices, like you mentioned, involving corpses, skulls, blood, meat, ashes, even sexual fluids. Now, these are impure practices. So my question is, like, were these practices already going on among the forest people or whatever, and they became incorporated and they sort of came, made, made their move, sorry, came into the mainstream? Or was this like a conscious refutation of Brahmanical orthodoxy at some point where because of its exclusive nature and its tough hierarchy, there was a sort of a subtle revolution among the people where they rejected its concept of purity and this deliberately started doing everything impure. This is, I mean, there's not an easy answer. This is a, still a question that the scholars debate with one another. Um, so I would say that um, much of the transgressive sexual rituals in particular um, that develop within Tantra um, are developed by Brahmins who are um, feeling like um, in specific secretive, that's important, ritual context, that they can break all the purity codes of Brahmanism in the most radical ways and that that will sort of um, slingshot them to liberation. You know, so here you think of people like Abhinava Gupta in the Kashmiri Shaiva tradition where you have, um, you know, th this wasn't, again, it was important this was done privately. These, these Brahmins would not have wanted people to know they were doing this, but in the context of secret rituals, they're, you know, you're the most polluted of substances you're consuming. You're having sexual relations out of wedlock. So adulterous sexual relations often with, um, this is a Brahmin often having it with a, a Dalit woman. You know, and that was very deliberate to just um, that by that these sort of social obstacle, these sort of social categories and restrictions are ultimately holding you back, your mind back from fully becoming liberated. But that was a that was totally a Brahminical thing. It wasn't so it was it wasn't like non Brahmins weren't really doing those rituals. So they, they're transgressive, but they're made by Brahmins for Brahmins. However, there are parts. Um, David Gordon White's book, Kiss of the Yogini, talks about um, sort of pre-Brahminical, um, you know, more indigenous roots um, with Yogini traditions for some of these ideas about the power of sexual fluids. Um, so it's not quite as simple as what I just said. And the part that is definitely, I feel like, part of indigenous traditions um, is the blood sacrifice part. So separate from the sexual stuff, um, the sexual stuff, I think, for a lot of Indians would have been would have been transgressive and wouldn't have been part of popular practice. That was happening in secret ritual context and by elite, typically high caste practitioners. However, the very idea of blood sacrifice, I don't think, would have been considered transgressive to most everyday Indians. Like, if you're living in rural society, goddess worship is very popular. And many of these goddesses, the idea is that um, they are giving out their life energy in order to sustain the world, right? Their Shakti is coming out into the world to sustain um, the earth itself and nature, but also human life. And in giving out that Shakti, they need to be reinvigorated, these goddesses. And how do you do that? 
you regain you with blood with with blood sacrifice right so that becomes a fundamental part of um kind of Hindu religiosity at, you might say, you know, a, an indigenous, a, a folk level um, early on and, and and persist to the present in a way that I don't even think it's fair to consider blood sacrifice as, as transgressive, if that makes sense. Okay, but so just to go on further with that, so for example, I'll take one, uh, I'll take one specific example. Um, menstruation there is a, in brahmanical hinduism there is this whole concept around uh, a menstruating woman being impure and for uh, in tan in tantra like i'm just curious did they actually believe that the blood uh, the related to menstruation would actually empower them did they believe in that or was it just to piss off the brahmins like like the fact that they made uh. it such a special thing in their offering was it an overt refutation, rejection of Brahmanical orthodoxy, like doing just going the opposite way, or did they really believe they're going to extract power from that? It's a good question. I mean, part of the problem for this is like when, as a textual scholar, you know, our evidence comes from texts that are Brahminical for the most part. So we don't, it's not always easy to sort of, um, to, to isolate what the pre-tantric um, practices and beliefs were prior to them getting incorporated into tantric scriptures, which I, again, I think is as these indigenous folk or whatever you want to call them practices and beliefs get brought into the Brahminical fold, that's, you, that's how you see them. That's when you see them as tantra. So to see their like pre-tantric form it's not always easy to find that. We can kind of imagine what that was before that. Um, but I don't necessarily think that um, these ideas about um, the power of um, menstrual blood as both something that is simultaneously has this incredible potency. This is where you children come from this, yet also sim so simultaneously potent and polluting. I don't think that was just devised as a way to say, you know, screw you to Brahmins. I think that was um, almost certainly... Um, you know, a sincerely held idea, but to from what sort of stratum of Indian culture that sort of conception of menstrual blood comes from, I, I couldn't tell you. Got you. And um, so I found the quotes that you shared from Tulsi Das and Kabir very interesting. I had not come across those quotes, but they just make perfect sense given the way we are sort of, the way religiosity is introduced to us growing up in India. It's very common for like the this is just inherent. I don't think anybody ever told us this, but like the fact that you don't need mantras or rituals, you can connect with God in your own words directly. Like this is something that is just inherent the way we think about religion from the very beginning. So when we look at the words that you just shared from Kabir and all, it just makes sense that they would say something like this because that is sort of we share until the present age. Um, and it also explains something that I've been curious about for a long time, that how did yoga decline if yoga is such a beneficial practice uh, in terms of like body and uh, mental health, fitness, like now what we realize how the huge benefits of yoga, but then it's not as prevalent as it ought to be. Like presumably it was very prevalent back in the day in India, but then why, why did such a beneficial thing decline at least in urban areas? And this sort of answers that if, if, influential people like Kabir and Surdas were going and denouncing yogas and yogis and their importance, I can totally see why it would begin to de start declining. Well, I, I mean, I have to complicate that a little because it, it's, it's specifically tantric yoga and the knots that they're critiquing. So bhakti traditions were all practicing forms of yoga, um, but they were forms of bhakti yoga you know these were devotional forms of yoga and often they were sort of even taking and i talk about this some in the book they were taking some sort of techniques ritual techniques from the tantric tradition but employing them in kind of a bhakti context so you really see this like detailed inner visualization in many ways this is kind of a tantric thing but you see it um, in lots of bhakti traditions from the Bhagavata Purana all the way into, um, you know, the Rusic traditions um, that happen later, where you're imagining, you know, you're in detail um, Krishna or yourself as um, one of Krishna's um, 
you know, consorts or um, all these things kind of use tantric ritual technologies, but in a bhakti context. So I don't, that's interesting that you feel like yoga has sort of declined because that's not exactly the point I'm making. I mean, yoga gets totally, that's a whole different story, of course. It gets totally transformed what yoga means. And there's, um, you know, modern yoga is born in during the colonial era, of course, since Mark Singleton's written about this and lots of others. But yoga, I don't think really goes anywhere in this period. It's just that bhakti is defining its identity and part of that new identity is you don't need to perform these intense yogic practices or tantric rituals in order to achieve liberation. All you have to do is love God, sing God's name, um, listen to the stories of God, you know, and, and this is the heart of it. And for especially like ascetic communities, like um, Bhakti Sampradayas, like the Gaudiyas and the Ramanandis, they were still practicing forms of of devotional yoga, but I think the populace at, at large, you may be right, was, wasn't was fine because yoga is time consuming, right? This sort of meditative that's practice. A, yeah. That's what I was thinking. You've got all the lazy people in his fold like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be honest. I feel like if you look around the world, most of popular religion is devotional in nature. It's, it's the most accessible form. It's um, easy. You know, who well. has time for intense asceticism and meditation on a daily level um uh, uh, absolutely let me let me get in a question from um one of the attendees dr karen pichalas she's actually a scholar of bhakti so she might come up with a less ignorant question like mine uh, um dr pichalas can you turn on okay perfect okay yes, you're, you're, hello. thank you for this wonderful talk uh Patton, Dr. Brickshet. Um, I really was going to follow up on an opening that you had had put it, slipped into your talk, which is what is the process of the textualization that authorizes bringing some of the popular practices in? Um, does this have to do with the Agamas or the Samhita? I mean, how where would you locate that? And what, if anything, can we say at this point about that textualization process? No, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, the funny thing is, um, I'm much more of a bhakti scholar than a tantra scholar. And here I am giving a talk primarily on tantra. So um, this part of, of, of my book, when I get into this idea is, it's a bit speculative, though I feel like it's certainly grounded, but I think this is an area that I'll, the, the Tantra scholars, the Tantric studies folks, I would really love to see them do more work to sort of lay out how this specifically happens. In the book, I use, um, I, I gave one example drawing on Fred Smith's works from how um, kind of folk practices of possession likely are what became like Brahminical practices of, of Nyasa. But a more specific example I give is from the work of um, Michael Slauber, who talks about um, the Gurudaka tradition. So there are all these um, Bhuta Tantras and Gurudaka Tantras, where basically um, the Tantrika in these texts is essentially a kind of a healer, and, and their focus was especially healing um, snake bites. And so it seems very likely when you look at what these Garudakas, like what they're doing, what they are, it just, you know, again, I don't have, that's where the actual like detailed research needs to be done to lay this out. But it seems very clear that they must have been some sort of like indigenous healer type personality um, that had some sort of shamanic form of possession of Garudaka and was then doing healing th from it. And then you look at the Garudaka Tantras and you see that sort of figure get textualized and what they were doing this, that was probably a kind of loose orally transmitted form of like um, possession and healing get sort of codified into a Tantric ritual form um, in the, in these Tantric scriptures, the Garudaka Tantras. So I don't know if that helps, but unfortunately, I don't like get into the details of that process really any more than that. But, but I would, I hope scholars kind of do do that dirty work. <laughs> that just, that just a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> that just reminds me of like really famous films from India from the 1980s when uh, they would have these 
tantrics and shape shifting snakes and how the tantrics uh, especially and especially the nath tantrics right so they would show those cults where they look at goraknath uh, as their sort of founding uh, figure and then they would they would basically have the powers to to, to get to um to sort of like overpower these ship ship shifting snakes who get their divine power from shiva and everything so it's actually really interesting because i mean they, these were all like works of fiction i don't think they were based on any perhaps on some folk stories but not definitely not on any kind of uh, um scripture or literary literary works but uh, in those days these films were popular and like they sort of like created our first impressions of tantrics as these really powerful but as you said immoral beings who mm-hmm. can choose to be moral but can choose to be immoral it's totally up to them and that sort of some of these films actually explicitly say this that you you invested so much in your uh, siddhis the powers you did all these ter- difficult uh, meditations and uh, yoga yogi yogas and all that and you achieved all these siddhis but yet you chose to take the wrong path you could have used all this for a good purpose but you chose so they it's interesting because religion the way we think about it at least in modern day is is inherently moral right when we think of god it's almost like synonymous with good and god should always take the side of the good of the honest and support them and always we make i, I guess like truth will win over evil or good forces win over you that's like a very basic i guess if we make forget about all the rituals and practices which may come from tantra i think this is the biggest difference that we have from tantric philosophy but contemporary god is not amoral is inherently moral like morality is defined by god you're supposed to be moral because that's what god wants you to do i agree and again i think this is again it's maybe you can't assume influence necessarily but this is an interesting way where islam and bhakti line up right there is a supreme god who by definition is moral is benevolent that's a key aspect of that deity's identity that supreme god whereas you're right for the tantrika um the divine is power and you access that power and maybe you use it for good maybe you use it for evil but it, the divine is power to be accessed and employed yeah and fascinatingly um many of the ancient religions were ambivalent about god's morality in a similar way not just in india but i think even if you think about the ancient greeks their religion the gods are not necessarily moral they're just powerful right. and so it just sort of makes sense that possibly well, i just supports i don't know this is all conjecture but it supports uh the view that these tan- some of the tantras ideology may have preexisted in india for a very long time when we know that in ancient times a lot of local people would probably worship their nagas or yakshas for specific purposes for specific uh support in their life whether it was harvest or or uh, having a child or whatever so those gods are not necessarily moral you worship them you make them happy and you get whatever you want and to me this is quite interesting because later on in uh, bhakti period like the i guess i, I have i can i'm i can't talk at length about gita but the, one of the most um important things that we learn about gita is that god says that you shouldn't worship all these other gods for small small different different things because then you will get distracted from your path to moksha I, i guess you you were saying something similar about patanjali telling people not to go get into all these other yogs siddhis but th- this is one of the things like there is an incident in bhagavad purana where uh, krishna actually tells the people of a village not to worship a vedic god uh, who are villagers are afraid for good weather and all that and he says you should only worship vishnu in the vaishnava tradition and mm-hmm. and because they don't then that god brings calamity on the village and that's when krishna as a child he lifts up a mountain and still saves them from that calamity so but still saying that like you shouldn't get distracted and go to these various gods but you can see there's a really there's there you can sense that there is a movement going on trying to bring in all the people into your fold uh taking them away from whichever different cults or religious streams they were sort of involved in 
I, yeah. I, I find all this really fascinating in terms of like what we can interpret from these religious scriptures in terms of this what was going on historically at the time, like the social forces that were at play. You also see this in the level of um, mantras, right? So in, in tantric tradition, there are all these different mantras, some of which are semantically meaningless, right? These bija seed mantras, um, but they're considered to be the forms, the sound forms, sonic forms of deities. But by the time you get to this, um, at least North India's bhakti movement, um, there is only one mantra, which is the name of God. So all these other mantras, you're not supposed to, so you see almost like... Um, this centralization happened where now it's just the name of God, all these other mantras that are sonic, you know, that stuff doesn't work. That's that tantric stuff, but chant the name of God and that will get you there. And, you know, this may be too simplistic, but I think one dimension of this is that the Mughal empire was arguably the most centralized state India had ever had up to that. And so there's a mirror central, the political centralization in on the religious you know, now, just as the emperor is uh, is to be worshipped um, in a certain sense, God, too, is is like an emperor in this centralized state. Um, again, I think that's overly simplistic, but I do wonder if that new political context of centralization had some effect on the kind of centralization of God in a certain sense um, that's happening. No, and you're absolutely right. Like the mantras, the way we are sort of at least the uh, in... The common impression in India is that mantras, we don't think of them as ineffective. We think they're powerful, but you should not go in that direction. Like it's sort of like, oh, th those are things that are really powerful, but you stay away from them. You just take God's name again and again and again. And they're chanting God's name, but instead of like, and we believe, well, I don't know if we, most people believe, maybe I'm superstitious, but there is a concept that those things can be powerful with sort of, you don't want to get involved in those powers. You know, like superstitions, like, oh, stones can have powers, but stay away from all those uh, precious stones. They might influence you in strange, weird ways. So there's like these fears now associated with them. That's what I want to point to. That there are these collective memories that how these mantras used to be powerful and people would rely on those powers. But now there are fears associated with the fear of being of the unknown kind of thing. Which is why the the tantra that's kind of making a comeback is is typically very quick to identify itself as white tantra. They often use that, that word, you know, so even it's mixed with kind of the new age spirituality scene in India, where you have people talking about the power of mantra, of kundalini yoga, of, you know, but all kind of typically put to use for some sort of consumer capitalist desire, you know, so I can get this career or get this material thing that I want. Um, it's, it's been interesting to see kind of Tantra get repurposed in that way. I wonder if it actually ever disappeared because I think in the, India has its ways that like everything sort of coexists. It just goes, morphs into something else and like stays in these various pockets and then re-emerges at other times. Uh, oh, and, right. yeah. and I have been to temples, I don't want to get too much, but I have been to like temples where uh, Tantric traditions are practiced fairly overtly and Although it might sound like superstition and all that the mantras and like just chanting of something, but I, in my personal experience, what it does is that it does create some sort of energy around it. So it's hard. It doesn't make sense until you experience it. And when you experience just the rituals and having to go through all the rituals, even if you don't understand it, it does create a, a kind of vibe and energy. And I can see why people would find that spirit, a, a spirit, spiritually moving and why they would have these spiritual experiences through those mantras and those rituals. It, uh, I think it's one of those things that you got to experience to be uh, to, to make sense of it. But I just wanted to very quickly come on the, to the last question I had, which was that you talked about Delhi Sultanate, that how the, uh, well, the pat royal patronage, as well as the popularity of Sufi sects, as well as on the other side, the rapid expansion of bhakti, uh, and both de denouncing uh, Tantra kind of resulted in uh, Tantra sort of getting moved to the periphery of the Indian religious spectrum and also it lost royal patronage. Um, so that is well understood. But I just, I'm just curious as to before, like during Tantra's age of prevalence, when it was the dominant form of religiosity, so before the Delhi Sultanate, 
were there still groups that were um, that rejected tantra and were still standing aloof, sticking with uh, Brahmanical orthodoxy or some kind of Puranic traditions, but rejecting tantra and denouncing it even before the Delhi Sultanate period? Certainly, yes, um, <coughs> and particularly those um, who remain remained within Brahmanical orthodoxy, they just said, no, Tantra is not a valid revelation. So there, there were plenty of groups that were um, opposed to these Tantric communities. Um, and again, that's, you know, that's all occurring in, that's the kind of sphere of uh, that other scholars are gonna be able to answer this question a lot better than, than I am. But the short answer is, is yes, there was, there were definitely, um, the Brahminical um, orthodoxy that uh, opposed these tantric communities and the new kind of newfound power that they were they were getting, and um, I think that would be the prime. The, the big difference, though, is there isn't that kind of um, there is an opposition coming from the bhakti side earlier on. Um, so far as I'm aware, it's coming more from orthodox Brahminism. Um, because they've got their position taken from them, right? And they don't think that these tantras are valid revelation. Um, but you don't see um, early on during the tantric age, so far as I'm aware, you don't see any kind of bhakti traditions critiquing tantra or critiquing tantricas. They're, they're thoroughly kind of merged together. Okay, understood. Well, thank you. That, that was very enlightening. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and I hope... Uh, everybody who's going to watch this video is going to find it like very enlightening. There is so much lack of uh, knowledge around Tantra and it has been, uh, it, 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 people have sort of like, or going back all, as you said, all the way to 1200 people have been denouncing it and tarnishing it. So even if we do like one drop of effort in terms of rescuing its image, from how much it's been tarnished, I think that goes a long way. So I hope people who watch this video, if you find this interesting, if you thought it was informational, educational, do please share it with, among your own network uh, so that we can sort of help in dispelling a lot of misconceptions that surround uh, Tantra, which was and continues to be a great uh, school of re religious and philosophical thought in India. And thanks a lot, Dr. Uh, Professor Patan Bushet. It was a pleasure to have you with us and we hope to have you with us again in future. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye.